They're sitting around a table, probably a little bit bigger than the tables you're sitting at this morning. And he gives them this. He says, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the cup. It is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. You can imagine the magnitude of these words after just a few moments before this, he tells the disciples in verse 15, I've eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. He's even told them that this is about to happen, that he's about to be betrayed, he's about to be killed. And what he does in this moment by setting this table and giving them this meal, this last supper, Such a sacred moment. If it was you, you'd be sitting around that table grasping every moment you could, savoring every moment that you could with Jesus because you've been following him for three years now. And apparently he's about to suffer. And based on what he's told you in the past, you know he's about to suffer for your sins. What would your response be? How would you want to react to that? What would be your very next words after being in such a sacred moment like that? Maybe because we're in church here on Sunday morning, it's, it'd be a good response of some kind. It, it, it'd be a, a, a very holy kind of response as it should. But I'm guessing what you would say this morning would be your response is pretty much completely different from what the disciples said their response was. If, you're, if you have your Bibles open to Luke chapter 22, we're going to spend a few minutes here. I want you to grasp what they do uh, with Jesus just moments after he celebrates the meal that we just celebrated. This sacred moment. Even as we sang about it, oh, the blood of Jesus cleanses me, washes me this incredibly holy moment, this larger-than-life kind of moment, this this heaven-meeting-earth kind of moment, how do they respond? Look at verse 24. Also, a dispute arose among them as to which of them considered to be the greatest. Real smooth disciples, Really good move here. This is a great time for you to start arguing about which of you is the best. I mean, imagine this. And this is why we had communion before the message this morning. How great would it be if now that we've had communion, we just start arguing, throwing things at each other, trying to dispute which of us is the greatest in the room? That would be a church service like you've never seen before. I promise you that. Can you imagine that? I mean, can you imagine... I mean, how holy of a moment we just shared with each other in sharing the Lord's Supper. How much more of a holy moment that they had Jesus sitting at the table with them. How much even more of a holy moment that it was just hours before he was to be executed for their sins. And that's when they start arguing about which of them is the greatest. If you're Jesus, how would you respond to this? I mean, how would you react to such a moment like that? I mean, most of us probably respond with some kind of anger, some kind of deep frustration, right? Haven't you guys been listening? Maybe even a bit of fear, this idea of, you mean, I'm going to leave the keys of the kingdom to these guys after I ascend into heaven? I mean, I've poured three years of my life into these 12 guys, And in this sacred moment, they start arguing about which of them is the greatest. They're the hope of the church. I'm supposed to build the church on one of these guys named Peter? What? This this plan is falling apart. Just one of the thoughts I would have if I were in Jesus' shoes. That's not how Jesus responds. He does a little bit of teaching. Let's read through uh, verses 25 and following about how Jesus talks about who is the greatest, really. We kind of referenced a bit of this last week as we talked about how the greatest things come from the smallest or the least things. Look at how Jesus responds. He looks at his disciples, verse 25, and he says to them, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. 
Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules should be like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? And then he, and then he turns and he helps them realize this isn't just some kind of a, 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 some really good principles of how to live your life. No, now he says, look at what I've done. Halfway through verse 27. But I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials. And I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. I mean, you want to get a picture of greatness. It is eternity in heaven with the Father, with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit. I mean, it is, that is, that is, that is greatness right there. But until that time, greatness is defined by those who serve. Greatness is actually in the little things. So Jesus takes this time, he teaches these things, but then he gives a very stern warning, which I want to draw our attention to. What we'll spend most of our time on this morning is in verse 31. Jesus says something that's very troubling. He starts talking to Peter. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, you may strengthen your brothers. So now, Jesus takes this, uh, this very helpful teaching of what it looks like to really be the greatest, being a servant, being the youngest, being the least, being willing to, to do the things that other people don't want to do instead of just uh, lord your authority over other people. And he teaches this, and I'm sure all the, all the disciples are being convicted by this. They're probably taking notes. They're probably wanting to grab on to, okay, I guess I understand how that could be the greatest. Okay, Jesus, I'm hearing you. But then he turns to Peter. And as he talks to Peter, he's actually including all the disciples that are still seated with him around this table where they just celebrated the Last Supper. And he tells him about this battle that is being waged over their souls. He says, Satan has come to me asking for you. He's asked that I might sift you as wheat. That's scary sounding before we even know what sifting wheat really is. Now, I'll be honest. Um, it's been a little while since I've sifted wheat, and by a little while, I mean my entire life. So if, uh, if you're a regular wheat sifter, then I just ask you to bear a little patience with me as I kind of share a little bit of what sifting wheat looks like. But this is an incredibly vivid image that Jesus paints for us on what, Jesus, uh, what Satan longs to do to us. And if we miss this, then we miss how, what this battle looks like that's being waged over us. This process of sifting wheat, of harvesting wheat, is actually twofold. First, after you've cut the wheat down, you bundle it up, you put it together, and then you do what's called threshing. Threshing is a very old-fashioned way to spread the wheat onto a floor that's usually very hard. It's made of stone, it's made of concrete, or, or, or just very hard uh, dirt. And then you beat it with something called a flail. And I think we even have a picture of what this looked like back in the day, okay? This is, this is high technology right here. This was uh, hand-drawn by me last week. Just kidding. No, it, it would look way worse. Um, you wouldn't even know they were stick figures if I was drawing this. But this is just an image of what it looks like to take a flail, which is a very hard, wooden, two wooden rods kind of attached by a couple of metal chains. So uh, I kind of get the picture of like uh, nunchucks, right? Any Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle uh, fans in here? Some nunchucks. One, one rod is very long. It's the rod that you hang on to. And then the other end is a very hard wooden rod that hits the wheat, and it begins to break up the, the, the outside casing of the wheat kernel. What this does is it, it separates the good stuff from the bad stuff. It takes the protective layer off of the wheat so you can get at the good stuff inside. But then it's, it's a second step. And the second step is taking what's called a sieve. And if you can just imagine like a, like a big baking sheet, 
but it's got a bunch of holes in it created by a bunch of wire meshing. Now, uh, uh, you might like to uh, use this to strain your pasta uh, and let the water out and everything like that, but this is a little bit different. You see, these weren't just any kind of wire meshings. It was wire meshing put together in such a way so that the holes were only big enough that the only thing that could fall through is the, the good kernel of wheat. What's, what's left after you've broken off the hard casing, the chaff is blown away, and all you've got is the good stuff inside, what you use to make food, right? Only that stuff can make it through. Now, in order for, you, for it to make sure that it's only getting the good kernel of wheat out of this, is that um, the wires are, are, are actually kind of sharp and jagged. They're rough. They're, they're, they're not, not comfortable in any kind of way. And you take this and you shake it back and forth. So, it, so it's kind of breaking away, peeling away, cutting at this to make sure that anything that is undesirable, this hard casing, this protective stuff around it, will stay on top of the, the sieve and the good stuff will fall through. So when... Uh, when, when when we get this glimpse of what Jesus is talking about, of how, how Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. And again, this wasn't just for Peter, but actually the you that's, that's talked about here when, when he says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. The you there is actually plural, meaning that he is talking about everybody, all those disciples that are in that room, which would make it easy for us to assume that, that Satan is coming after each one of us and asking the very same thing, that he might beat us to take off this protective layer that he might sift us as so to, to cut away all, all the protective layers of the good stuff and that, that we might fall through this sift into his hands. And so imagine this. If, 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 if Satan is saying, I want to sift you as wheat, imagine you are that good kernel of wheat. What's inside? And what's around you, this protective layer, the chaff and the, the, the hard casing around it, is your faith. It's what protects you. It's what keeps you from falling through the sift and into Satan's hands. It's this faith. And how do we know this? This is what Jesus prays for, right? Look at verse 31 again. Simon, Simon, or Peter, Peter, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. In other words, I have prayed that this protective covering around you might not fail. Even though you're beaten, even though you're shaken across this this, this, uh, wiry, sharp, jagged, sifting sieve, I pray that your faith will not fail. I pray that this will not be broken off of you and you will fall through into Satan's hands. That's my prayer for you. This is what Jesus says to Peter. This is what he says to all the disciples. So how does Peter respond? Look at this. Peter's response is great. In verse 33, but he replied, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. Peter saying, nothing can, nothing can take this. No, nothing can take away my faith in you, Jesus. But Jesus responds, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me. And Jesus brings him back to another place of humility where just minutes before they were arguing about who was the greatest, now he has made them completely aware that what they're about to face is going to be hard. Because Satan is looking to sift them. What's amazing to me is that Peter would come to know this very well. Over the next few years after this, Peter, on which God built his church, he called him Petros or Rock, the rock on which I build my church. That's how Peter was known. God would build his church on Peter, which meant Peter would have been targeted. He would have been imprisoned. He would have been flogged. He would have, he would have suffered for the name of Jesus. And time and time again, he'd have to come back to this place where he'd, he'd have to say to himself, I know Jesus is praying for me. 
that my faith will not fail because right now I'm being beaten and I'm being sifted and I'm, I'm, I'm being torn apart by, by all this jagged stuff that's happening in my life. But my faith will not fail. And Peter became very aware of how real Satan and his attacks were and how real they are. That's why he wrote about it in his first letter, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. He says this, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan is prowling, looking for ways to devour. He'll try to beat you. He'll try to shake you. He'll try to break off that faith that is protecting you. He'll try to hit you where it hurts. He'll attack in the most subtle ways or in the most obvious ways. John Piper says it this way. It is relatively unimportant to Satan whether we are healthy or sick, rich or poor. What he wants is to sift out our faith. If he can do it by suffering, he will try that. If he can do it by great wealth, he will try that. See, what Jesus does is he takes this petty little argument that the disciples begin to have that could have potentially ruined the most holy and sacred moment possibly recorded in the New Testament. And he draws them to be very aware of how to be equipped to move forward. With only days to live, this, and really here in this passage, with only hours to live before he was put to death on the cross, Jesus wants them to be ready for what's coming. Because he knows that his church moves forward with his people. He knows that his church moves forward with you. And with that comes the attack of this prowling lion, this master deceiver who looks to attack. This question that keeps begging for my attention, that keeps drawing me back here. The thing that I see that's at stake here, what what's, keeps coming after me this week as I've been looking at this, is, is, is just imagining the Lord saying to me, Dave, if you only knew the battle that was being waged for your soul right now. I mean, if you only knew how Satan was coming after, maybe you're very aware of it. Or maybe Satan in very subtle ways is deceiving. If you only knew the battle that was being waged for your soul, It'd be a terrifying thing to consider. It is a terrifying thing to consider. And while we, while, while we may be shaken, we cannot be broken. While it may be something to fear, we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear this prowling lion, this slithering serpent, this deceptive liar of liars. We don't fear because... Jesus prays for you. The Son of God prays for you. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. I have prayed for you that you may stay strong. That even though Satan beats at you and shakes you, he may shake you, but he will not break you. And Jesus knows this because he spent 40 days in the wilderness and during those 40 days in the wilderness with no, no food and no water, nothing to eat, nothing to drink, Satan comes after him three different times and three different times just in the way he comes after you except Jesus doesn't fall into temptation. Satan, trying to beat, beat him up, trying to break him, trying to sift him, cannot get Jesus. Jesus wins. And then when you just think that, that Jesus has been broken, when Jesus dies on the cross and is laid in a grave, you can just imagine the rejoicing that's, that's going on with Satan 
and his demons, as they think they've beaten and they've broken, the only one who can make you strong, victory. Can you imagine the fear that they experienced when he descended into hell to proclaim victory? And then three days later, rose from the dead. As if to say, death cannot do anything to me. Sin cannot do anything to me. And Satan, while you attack, you cannot do anything to me. I mean, these are his parting words with his disciples. With only hours to live, Jesus wants his disciples to know, you may be beaten, you may be broken over some really hard, rough surfaces. There may be attacks, but I want you to know this, I'm praying for you. And while they shake you, they will not break you. You will be made strong. Your faith will, will withstand this pressure, this, this hardening, this shaking, this sifting. You will not be sifted out and fall into Satan's hands. I'm praying for you. With days to live, Jesus draws us to this incredible intimate moment for us to deal with this matter of the soul. It's a matter that begs our utmost attention. Because someday, when this life is over, when we stand before the greatest, and he speaks judgment over our lives, that will determine the rest of eternity for all of mankind. He will either see one that has fallen away from the faith, whose faith was left behind and fell through into the hands of Satan and say, be gone from my presence. Or he will look at you and he will see your faith and he will see someone who received that faith from Jesus. And though you were shaken and though Satan tried to sift you, You were not broken. Your faith was made strong because the power of God, the God who was dead and is now alive, who suffered for us, makes us strong. So we do not fear. With only hours to live, in this Lenten season, we take a look at just the last few teachings of Jesus before he went to the cross. He wanted his disciples to know, I'm praying for you. You will not be broken. This matter of utmost importance for each of us, for all of you, that's the promise of the Father. He will protect you. He will strengthen your faith. You have nothing to fear. You will not be broken. Let me pray for us. God, how grateful we are that a moment like this where an argument of who is the greatest broke out, you would draw us to such a wonderful promise that you pray for us, that our faith may not fail. So God, may we pray that same prayer for each other. Lord, where we feel weak, may you make us strong. Lord, for those of us where Maybe it feels like Satan's winning the battle. May he be pushed back in the name of Jesus because he makes us strong. May each of us stand here saying, even though you may shake us, Satan, you will not break us because our king lives forever. Lord, may that stir in our hearts. May that move us to follow you this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.